Hi folks, here we are with part two of part two of chapter six, uh, propositional logic, and we're going to look at rules of inference and replacement rules. Now there's a number of these rules. Um, you probably will not have time to memorize all of them, so I have um, obtained a sort of cheat sheet for you that I hope it helps. So let me share the screen with you. Um, I'm going to show you two exercises here from 611. Uh, they're the two starred ones. <clears throat> well, let me show you the sort of uh, cheat sheet first, rules of inference. So there are eight rules of inference. There's actually nine. There's a destructive dilemma. CD is a constructive dilemma. Um, I'll explain what all these symbols mean here in a second. Um, so we'll uh, we'll look at that. This sheet just has constructive dilemma. This has uh, rules of replacement. I'll explain these too. Okay, so I'm going to take a little bit of time now and explain these. Um, if you haven't seen part one of this week's homework um, explanation, uh, please watch that. I think it's pretty long. I think it's about 18 hours long. So um, be sure and take plenty of naps and um, grab a sandwich and cancel uh, everything for three weeks and uh, watch that one uh, before you watch this one. Okay, so uh, rules of inference. So what do we have here? What are rules of inference? So rules of inference are just valid argument forms, simple valid argument forms based on natural reasoning that um, we can use to uh, prove that an argument is valid. And um, it's an alternative to the truth table. Right? So in the last video, you saw that there's the long truth table method where you put every possibility of the components of an argument, um, including its individual components, the uh, premises and the conclusion on the table and then just write out every single possibility in terms of truth values of the components. Then there's the short, uh, the short version of the truth table where you try to force a row where you have true premises and a false conclusion, which would is essentially a counter argument to a, a claim of validity. If you can uh, give true premises and a false conclusion as a counter argument, then you have proven that the argument form is invalid. So what rules of inference are is they're just very simply um, argument forms where they are completely valid in their truth tables. I should say they're valid. There's not a completely, it's, there's no degrees. It's either valid or invalid when you're talking about argument uh, forms. <clears throat> so, so what we have here is, uh, I just have the short form here. You can look in the book for what these mean, but this is the modus ponens rule. You'll notice this, we've talked about it a lot. Uh, if the first premise, you, what we have here is a different way of writing out the arguments. The slash just means that what follows is the conclusion. And the premises are um, separated by a, uh, let's see, separated by, let's see, what do I want like there? Do I want the arrow? No, I don't know if I want the arrow. Um, okay. Uh, separated by a comma, okay? So premise one in the modus ponens argument form, if P then Q. The second premise is P, therefore Q. So you can look up from the last video an argument that had a, a truth table with this argument form in it, and you'll see that there is no row with true premises and a false conclusion, which means that it is a valid argument form. Also, if you did a short form, uh, you would not be able to force a true, pr true, you would not be able to force a row with true premises and a false conclusion, okay? These are the simplest valid argument forms that are comprehensive enough that logicians have accepted are comprehensive enough that these are all you need to 
prove just about any argument as being valid or not, okay? So what you're mostly gonna be given for these are, um, in fact, I believe all you're gonna be given is uh, valid arguments. And so you just need to use the rules of inference to apply them is all you're gonna be doing and um, apply them and prove the conclusion. So these are proofs. Sometimes these are called natural deductions or uh, natural proofs, uh, deductive proofs. So you have the modus tollens form, I mean the modus ponens form, then you have the modus tollens form, if P then Q and not Q. Now this is a, a slightly, a slight variation on the tilde here for the uh, negation operator, but it looks a little bit like it, so that should be not too difficult to remember. So this means it's not the case of Q, so not Q, therefore not P, right? So sometimes also called a fir, uh, denying the consequent, okay? Remember you have the antecedent and the consequent in a conditional. The valid argument forms are modus tollens, which is denying the consequent, and that allows you to, to, der to derive or infer, you can use either term, uh, the negation of the antecedent. With modus ponens, uh, you are affirming the antecedent, which allows you to derive the consequent, right? And that's the consequent there, right? That's the negation of the antecedent. Next, we have hypothetical syllogism, and that has this form, if P then Q, and if Q then R, then if P then R, okay? If you just look at that, uh, these P's and Q's here in the book, they're lowercase um, italicized. In this chart, they're capitalized. It's not really a big deal. The uh, slightly different stand, uh, slightly different um, um, ways of writing these things, but it all amounts to the same thing. Hypothetical syllogism. So P is a variable. It, can, it means uh, any. You can stand for any statement whatsoever, as complex or as simple as you like. Yeah, if one statement or one complex of statements, uh, then another one, and then that one, then another one, then this follows. So you um, can go and look at some of the examples that are given for these. It's pretty, it makes perfect sense. If P then Q, if Q then R, then obviously if P then R. So that just seems like a like, like a logical, these are based on, like, as I say, natural forms of thinking. It's just, um, and uh, you can think of examples. I'm not gonna pause here for examples, but I'd be happy to, to give some if you like. Uh, this one is called disjunctive syllogism. Uh, a syllogism is just uh, an old fashioned term for uh, two premises and a conclusion. So this is a disjunct, Right. This is a disjunct, a disjunction operator, the uh, V here. So, um, if P or Q, and not P, then Q. Kind of makes sense. If you have one thing or another, but not one, then uh, the other. Uh, and remember, P and Q could both be true, and the disjunction be true. But certainly, if one is um, not true, then the other has to be true, because we're assuming that each premise is uh, true, right? So this is saying, assuming this and this, then this has to follow, has to follow. So if you did a truth table of this, you would not find any line, a full truth table, you would not find any line with true premises and a false conclusion, okay? Then you have the addition, maybe one of the strangest ones, oh, let me come back to addition, conjunction, right? If you have P and you have Q, then now this is in place of the ampersand, it's the inverted wedge. So uh, in this table, it's used, um, this is used instead of the ampersand. It just means and, you think of or as being opposite of and, um, and you get and. So if P, and Q, then P and Q. That's just no duh kind of stuff. That's what logic tends to be. Um, the, ob the, the sort of corollary to that is the simplification rule. If you, uh, 
yeah, if you have P and Q, right, and again, in the book, this would be an ampersand. If you have P and Q, then therefore P, right? If, uh, if it's the case that, uh, you know, Detroit is north of, uh, Detroit is west of uh, Maine, and uh, apples taste good, then uh, def if that's true, if, that, if this conjunction is true, then definitely the first one is true. Okay. And the constructive dilemma is if P or Q, and if P then R, and if Q then S, then uh, R or S. So if you look at this, you have if P then, look at these two first. Um, if P then R, and if Q then S, and it's true that P is true or Q is true, then certainly either R or S is true, right? This isn't used as often, um, but, um, but it should make sense if you look at it there. If it's true, if P then R, and if it's true, if Q then S, and if it's true that it, either P is true or Q is true, then either R or S is true. And I'll show you how to use these in a minute. Now, the addition is kind of uh, strange, but um, the addition rule is that if you have any statement, P, or any combination of statements, P, that we're saying if P is true, then you could say P or anything at all, anything at all. Okay, so consider this. Um, two and two is four, like either, okay, two and two is four, so that's true. So either two and two is four or unicorns are real, okay? Now unicorns are real, presumably we all agree that's false, but the disjunction of two and two is four or unicorns are real is true. So anything that you add to, uh, by way of disjunction, not conjunction, but disjunction, that's or, to something that's true is, it, is the whole disjunction, disjunction is gonna be true, all right? Either I'm from Dallas, Texas, or um, aliens fought at the Alamo. Okay, that's obvious Texan thing that I pulled out there. Um, that's a true disjunction because one of them is true. So in a disjunction, if you remember looking at the truth table for disjunction, the only time a disjunction is false is if both are false. Okay. Um, let's see, the destructive dilemma. Um, okay, the destructive dilemma just says, is just like the constructive dilemma, except except it would say, um, okay, so let me, let me write here. Um, let's see. Draw. Okay, so this would be if uh, not. Let's see how I can well I can run and draw with a a mouse or uh, not very well. It turns out not R or S, not S. Let's see. Okay, this is not going to look very good, but. Maybe you can tell. Oh, wait a minute. I think I have a touch screen. Let's see if that works. Uh, and this one would be, ooh, yeah. Big, stupid fingers. I'm not cute. Okay, probably be better with the mouse. So just replace the conclusion with that and replace this one, this premise with that, okay? So uh, if not,
Yeah. She then are. Q and S, my Q, my S, my P and R. Okay. So this one goes in a positive direction here, where if you have these two, um, these two conditionals, these two conditionals, what you do is in the con in the uh, constructive dilemma, you're also asserting uh, P or Q. All right. And then that gives you R or S. With the destructive dilemma, you are asserting not R or not S and are able to derive along with these same conditionals, not P or not Q. It's a little bit of an opposite thing. I don't think you're gonna need them very much, but that's, uh, that's how you do that. Let's see here. So I gotta erase this. All right, so that's what you get with. Let's make this go away here. Beep, 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 beep. Okay. Okay. Unfortunately, it takes it with them, so I can't just leave it behind. I get them off my screen here. Okay. Now, rules of replacement. Okay, now the one thing about rules of inference is they have to be used for whole sentences, right? whole sentence statements. So you need a whole sentence to be if P then Q, or a whole sentence to be just P, right, in order to use this rule of inference. For the rules of replacement, you can replace individual components of sentences. Um, double negation, these are like no duh things too. So you can, anytime you see a P, you can replace it with, uh, oh, let's do this again, this is fun. Anytime you see a P, you can replace it with uh, not, not P, okay? So it's just no duh, right? We say like uh, two, um, um, well, anyway, sometimes we, well, sometimes some of us talk in uh, double negations, um, but uh, but then anyway, that's that's pretty self-explanatory. Um, implication: um, If you have a if you have a wedge here, and you have not P or Q. You can change that into because this means uh, if and only if. These are absolutely equivalent. Um, if P then Q. So this can change into that. Um, and what it means to say is absolutely equivalent. Uh, is to say that it's, <clears throat> if you put these two truth tables together, they would have the same truth values and um, on every row, every row, the, the truth tables for both of these would look the same, the truth tables for both of these would look the same, and similarly for all of these. For, um, Contraposition, um, if P then Q is the same thing as like flipping these and negating them, not Q, if not Q, then not, uh, not P. Okay, so you can flip those and negate them. Uh, De Morgan's rule, it's probably the most complex one, but if you have a, a conjunction that is negated within the parentheses here, so it's not the case that both P and Q, uh, if and only if, uh, it's not the case to P or it's not the case to Q, right? And if you look at the true tables for both of these, they would be exactly the same. And that works sort of in the opposite direction too. If it's not the case that P or Q, then that's absolutely equivalent to um, not P and not Q. Right? Um, so, I mean, you think about this like if it's not the case P or Q, then, you know, you, this is saying you can't have, it's not the case, either one of these, right? Not either one. So that means not one and not the other, 
right? And then similarly, you can do the same kind of reasoning here. If it's not the case that either one of these is true, no, I'm sorry, if it's not the case that both are true, then either one side is uh, not true or the other side is not true. Um, exportation, make sure that I'm saying that right. Exportation, yeah. Exportation, if you have uh, if P, then Q, then R. And uh, so this is the main connective. Uh, if and only if P and R, then uh, P, I mean, sorry, P and Q, therefore R, right? So you're probably not going to use these too much. You can just look at these, look at the, look in the book or look at, at this thing and kind of tell equivalence. Uh, P, if and only if Q, right? If and only if, if P then Q, and if Q then P. Uh, wait. God, wait, this is, all right, this is just a repeat of this for some reason. Let's contra again. So tautology, either P, uh, so P, if and only if P or P, it's just something, so you can add on a P, it's just a tautology. A tautology is, um, something that's always true, it's necessarily true. Commutation is a little bit like in math, P or Q can just be switched to Q or P, P and Q can just be switched to Q and P. Association principle, if you have the same, either a, a wedge or um, an ampersand or this inverted wedge, which means and, right, conjunction. Um, if you have two disjunctions, it doesn't matter where you put the parentheses. And similarly with the conjunction and then the distributive um, replacement rule. <clears throat> if you have P and Q or R, then you can replace it with P and Q or P and R. You see, you get P and Q or P and R. And similarly, if you have P or Q and R, then you can replace that with P or Q, right? Just like get that guy and then put P with this guy over here, P or Q and P or R. Okay, so let's go to the homework here. So what we do, now I have the answers in here in the blackened parts. But here's an argument, right? So if P then Q, premise one, um, either not Q or R, and then the third premise is P, okay? and then the slash just tells you that it's a conclusion. R is a conclusion, therefore R. So you read this, if P then Q, and not Q or R and P from that, we should be able to derive R. That's what the argument says. So I'm gonna kind of do it down here. So the fourth line I'm gonna say, and I haven't looked at these really close, so I may get this wrong. Okay. So we wanna derive R from this up here using those rules of inference. Remember these, these first rules, these guys here, these rules of inference, just valid inference rules. Okay, so what can we do? Well, it looks like we can use P to derive Q. So let's just apply that rule. So that means that um, on lines one and three, I can derive Q. So I can say uh, Q and, and that is from uh, one, three modus ponens, right? That's how we write that, modus ponens. So I'm just using this argument form. I'm seeing the argument form here. Let me close that, make this easier. <clears throat> okay. And uh, deriving Q. So I'm just, I'm preserving the truth. Sometimes this is called uh, truth preserving. These rules are truth preserving. As long as you go with valid arguments, you can analyze other 
supposedly valid arguments. And if they're valid, then you should be able to derive uh, one thing from the other. So I want to get R. So for, um, okay, so five. So what do I got here? Well, um, I want to get R. And I have Q, which is the opposite of this Q. So I wonder what I can do with that. Well, remember that, that's not it. Remember that not not Q is the same thing as Q. And that's from the, um, that's from number line four, the, um, I think it's congregation. Is that what we call it? MEG. The rules are replacement. Oh, DN. They're going, well, actually, in the book it's called. Yeah, DN. Double negative. Okay, so that's DN. All right. So I'm not there yet. So on line six. Remember that uh, disjunctive syllogism says <clears throat> this one here, that if you have P or Q and not P, therefore you can have not Q, right? You get not Q if you have these two premises because it's a, a valid argument form. <clears throat> so not not Q means not this side, Right, it's not the case that it's not the case of Q, so that means R must be true according to the DS rule. So I can have R here, and that's according to the DS rule that I applied on two and five. Let's see DS. Okay, and then I'm done because I've derived R from this argument, these premises I've derived are using the rules of inference and replacement rules. Now let's see if that's the same thing that Lewis Vaughn's people got. Let me make that clear that that's different. Looks like it. Yep, four, five, and six. So you put his, put his tildes a little closer together. And I did not look at that, okay? This is something that you can, you can, once you get the hang of, you just, you're just applying the rules, okay? And it's actually kind of fun. It's like doing a crossword puzzle or something. Okay, let's try this one. Um, so premise one is E or F. Premise two is not G or H. Premise three is it's not the case that or not E or H. And then you got the slash. So the conclusion that we're trying to get to is F and not G. Okay, now one way to do this is the strategy is to try to see in advance how I'm going to derive F and not G. But sometimes, and this is fine for you to do, just see where you can apply the rules. So I'm just going to put that down before I even know. So where can I apply some rules? Well, let's see. Where can I apply rules here? So it's not incredibly obvious. So let's look at the, um, sorry, that's the part one zoom there. It's finished loading. Okay, so we have some uh, disjunctions here. Let's see what we can do with those. Maybe use rules of inference on disjunctions. A lot of times De Morgan's rule comes in handy. Uh, what's this guy here? Okay. So we can turn uh, this into this. All right. Remember, that's like the ampersand right here. So do we have something that says it's not the case that P or Q? Okay. Let's see. It's not the case that P or Q. We do. We have it right there. So. We could just try this. Oh, let's see, how do I do this? Maybe I shouldn't use this thing. Okay, so we can just uh, do De Morgan's rule here. And how does that go again? De Morgan's rule, 
um, if it's not the case that P or Q, then we can do not P and not Q. Okay, so let's go back and do that. So not P and not Q. Oh, sorry, I'm doing it on this one. So that's E, not E, and not H. And here's our justification. This is our justification line. So this is uh, line three and then DM. Okay. <clears throat> so that's just give, saying that this is our justification for changing line three into this. Okay. Now we know from our conjunction inference rule that um, actually the simplification inference rule that if we have P and Q, then we can derive P. Similarly, we can derive Q. So either one of these we can, we can derive or both. So let's do that. Let's break it up. A lot of times breaking it up helps. So uh, we can do not E and not H. Oh, no, 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 I'm sorry. Not E, and that's from, let's see, for simp. And then six, we can do not H, and that's from for simp. Okay, is that what they call it? Simp? Simplification, yeah, simple. Okay, so we've derived these things here purely from valid argument forms that have been proven valid. You can do the um, do the truth tables on all of these. Um, I'm not sure if the book has it, but all of these have. You can do the truth tables on them and prove to yourself that all of these are valid argument forms, okay? Some of them are just very obvious, like modus ponens and simplification and conjunction. Um, but so now we have these things. Now remember we're going for F and not G. So how are we gonna get this? Well, let's see. If we have not H, then I can see right away that through disjunctive syllogism, I can have not G, all right? So seven, I can do not G, and that's from disjunctive syllogism on one and six. So that's just the two, I'm, I'm doing uh, this one and this one. So you apply these as premise one and then premise two, and then I can conclude or infer not G. Remember, because you have, um, if you have P or Q and not P, then you can have Q. Similarly, this could say P or Q, not Q, P. Um, so let me see, did I do that right? One, six, DS, one and six, uh, one and six. No, it's one, it's two and six, sorry. Okay, two and six. I'm sorry if I threw you off there. Two and six, not G or H. And if we have, that's premise one, and then not H means that I can have not G. I can deduce not G, okay? So now I need F somewhere. How do I get F? I'll maybe do one and five disjunctive syllogism, all right? So eight. Let's see, I think we can do F because of, now I can use one and five DS because one is E or F, that's premise one, just like P or Q, same form. And then five is not E, so disjunctive syllogism says I can have F, right? And I put down my justification there. So now with the replacement rule of conjunction, or no, it's not conjunction. I mean, it's not a replacement rule, it's a rule of inference. Then I can just add together, because remember, this is what I'm trying to get. It's what I'm trying to derive. 
And do we have it? We have F here and we have not G here. So we can put together F and not G and that's conjunction on seven, eight, I call it conjunction. Well, we call it con. I think our book calls it conjunction. Um, yeah, C O N J. And I think they capitalize these. Some of them do, some of them don't. But see, now we're we're done because we have derived the conclusion from the premises using only rules of inference and rules of replacement. Okay, and I'll give you a little hint. Usually, rules of replacement, you'll only need these relatively simple ones. You, you'll very, uh, very rarely need uh, some of these others, but they're there if you need them. We're just going to be doing mostly pretty simple ones. Uh, but if you get stuck, let me know. And um, oh, yeah, so here's the last thing is let's make sure that we got this right. Okay, so four through nine, DM, simp, okay. Well, the, the lines are just a little bit different. They did the simp on five, line five and line seven, where I did my simps right together, five and six. I just like saying I did my simps together. Um, it's just weird. Uh, makes me happy for some reason. Um, means nothing and but we get the same result we derive f and g the lines are going to be a little bit different because we applied the rules on slightly different lines but it's the same thing it doesn't have to be in the exact same order as long as you're applying the rules correctly then uh you know you could actually if you were applying many rules, or many lines here, uh, as long as you were applying the rules correctly and you ended up being able to derive this, uh, you ended up being able to derive the conclusion and you only use the rules even if you made some missteps and uh, did some of the rules unnecessarily, like derived things that you didn't really need. And, and here we derive things, some of, uh, well, I guess we did need everything. But uh, it's possible on some of them that you could derive things you don't really need. It's okay. You could be at line 15, line 28. doesn't matter as long as the result is the same and you've, and you've only applied either rules of inference or replacement, which both uh, all these rules have been proven to be truth-preserving, then, uh, then you'll get that right. Okay. So um, that's all for this one. And uh, a little bit of a long one. Let's see. I hope this video has helped your understanding of this uh, interesting material. Let me know uh, when you have questions or if you have questions. And uh, take care.